Uh, before I get started, so uh, how many people have experience in this domain at all? Wow, three people, awesome. So it's gonna be really boring for you guys, but for the rest of you, <laughs> you might learn something. Um, so my name is Vishnu. Um, I uh, work with data, build platforms, do stuff. I'm not a molecular biologist or a medicinal chemist or any of those things. My knowledge mostly has been sort of working on the job, working on this project for um, a nonprofit biotech company called Idri, it's based out of Seattle. Uh, we're doing a project for them to try to help um, accelerate sort of the drug discovery. Um, they actually develop vaccines uh, for infectious diseases like TB, malaria, Zika, and so on. So, so all of this is working with them. Um, all right, so general agenda. So like I said, there's gonna be, uh, originally when I you know, was planning to give this talk, I was like, oh, I'll just talk about drug safety assessment. Then I realized, well, there's this, all this, all this other domain knowledge that you would have to know in order to get to that point. And so it's almost like my analogy would be you're watching the eighth season of Game of Thrones without watching any of the other seven. That's how it would feel. So I thought, like, okay, I'm gonna spend some time recapping before we get to the battle with the Night King. So, uh, so yeah, so first half is gonna be largely just getting everyone caught up to speed on like what the domain is, how, how things have worked, and then Hopefully we'll get, um, spend some time talking about the actual safety assessment uh, portion. And then specifically, I wanna talk about this um, Tox 21 challenge and then um, the, the winner of that challenge and the, their implementation using deep learning and what they did. Sound good? All right. All right, we'll start with the history uh, a little bit. So drug discovery is a thing, has been around forever. <laughs> Uh, thousands of years people have been trying to, because you know, diseases have been around forever. Um, and um, you know, the Chinese, like, whatever, thousands of years they've been trying to do this. Inoculation has actually been around for 2,000 years. I actually didn't know this until I was researching for this. But anyway, this, this, uh, as you can see, people did, um, would like take uh, specimens or samples from like uh, infected areas, and then they would like apply it, inoculate themselves to, uh, to healthy patients to hope that, you know, it would actually help them. Uh, sometimes it did. Um, by the way, does anyone know what the difference between inoculation and vaccination was? I didn't actually know this till I was doing this. Yeah. Yeah. So apparently, inoculation, so vaccination is when you actually, you know, you, you take a thing, like, you know, disease, the original disease, but then you take a variant of it that's not as bad, and then you apply it, right? So the cowpox, chicken pox, example where the cowpox will not kill you, kill humans, it kills, it's, it's fatal to uh, cows, but then you sort of take that variant, inject yourself, and then now you're immune against, vaccinate yourself against the chicken pox, which is the, but inoculation is different, it's just taking the same thing without, without any variations, the, the same um, pathogen and applying it and hoping that your know, immune system will just be able to deal with it. <laughs> but then don't, don't apply it on, in, well, anyway. I don't want to get into details, but <laughs> so, um, but more recent efforts. Obviously, there's been a lot of progress made in the last, you know, hundred or so years. Jenner with the cowpox and smallpox vaccine, uh, Pasteur, and, and really penicillin was the breakthrough. They call it the miracle drug. Anyone know why it's called the, why it was called the miracle drug? Penicillin. No. So, it, it's. It's basically, it was supposed to be the one cure for all kinds of infectious diseases, right? Bacterial, that we know with bacterial. And of course, now we know that it's not, it's not there's resistant, bacterial resistant, uh, or say penicillin resistant, uh, antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria and so on. But at least back then, that was sort of, you know, was touted as the miracle cure. We'll talk about this concept a little bit more later. But, um, and so the second half of 20th century is when really things started taking off with uh, advances in chemical techniques and so on. And then this, this whole movement, really in the last 50 years, uh, came about, which is called rational drug discovery. You'll hear this term a lot in, you know, in the industry, which sort of question, begs the question, so what was it before? Was it just like irrational? Was they just like running around doing crazy things? And so the difference is it's kind of like that, which is 
this process sort of emphasizes the first time, hey, let's focus on the actual target, the biological target that we want to actually you know, go after, whether it be like a protein or an enzyme or the actual pathogen or something, and then figure out um, the small molecule that's going to go and like, uh, you know, interact with that to produce uh, a result that we want, either inhibit or like, you know, activate something. So this, this is the process that what they call rational drug discovery. Feel free to jump in and ask questions at any time. You don't have to wait till the end. Um, and, and so there's different techniques that are used to identify drug targets. Um, some of them, I'll just cover some of them. Like there's a bunch, but phenotypic screening, that's what's, what's known as classical pharmacology, which is just screening for positive changes in either sort of cell models or even like whole organisms. And so you just, you try to run it through a series of like small molecules and saying, hey, is there any sort of change that, that seems interesting? And then you do it in a high throughput. And then we'll talk about high throughput screening. Um, and there's gene association studies. So that's where you would um, study a population. And then you would see like, hey, I've got the genotype, the geno genotype for the population. So everyone know the difference between genotype and phenotype, right? So genotype is like your genome, and the phenotype is the traits that it actually you express. Uh, so anyway, so you have a population where, let's say you have both sets of data. You have the genotype and the phenotype. So you know what their genome is for a whole population. And then you know also what the phenotype is, what diseases they have or not have. And then the idea is, can you find correlations between, let's say, their, their genome and the traits that they're displaying, maybe diseases? Um, and it could be like genetic mutations, it could be anything, and then so you try to find correlations. That's the whole sort of thing. And they find, okay, so this nucleotide or this SNP or whatever is the cause, this mutation is the cause for we think that's leading to this, this disease or not, or maybe, you know. So, um, so that's association studies. And then there's proteomics, which is uh, chemoproteomics, which is just um, looking for, um, I want to say a wider net, like it's, it's like using small molecules. So which molecules are affecting which proteins? So, and then instead of just focusing on one target, like you, what if you, say, if you cast a wider net and then you said, hey, uh, what are all the things that potentially uh, could be happening here? And then and doing that earlier in the drug discovery process uh, so that you, you have more targets. Um, by the way, this is a big problem right now in the industry. Everyone talks about this where the fact that there are not many targets to go after and, and there and are you know, industry leaders who think that the number of uh, druggable targets uh, is actually pretty small compared to the, uh, you know, the whole human body. And this, this is one problem that they're trying to solve. Um, and then, of course, transgenetic techniques, which is just you know, recombinant DNA or like CRISPR-like things where now you're stitching together you know, DNA from different organisms to sort of you know, see how that would be used to test, right? So you have like... Um, yeah, so you'd have like mice with, you know, some DNA from another organism and whatnot. Biomarkers are a big thing. Um, so it's, it's, it's just a way to measure a substance. So it's like instead of measuring the actual disease or whatever, if there was a substance that was sort of highly correlated to the actual disease or pathogen, then you want to measure that. And it's easier to measure that than it's, it's sort of a marker for that thing, right? So, so these are all different techniques to like just identify drug targets. It's like, where should we go after? Like, you think about like, okay, rational drug design, you first go after your target, figure out what your target is, and then you, you know, so it's the lock and key sort of thing. So this would be like, what is my, what is my lock? How do I figure out what my lock is, right? Um, and this is the overall cycle. Um, I mean, not necessarily you have to go through all of these steps, like, but, but typically this is what happens when like, a new drug comes to market is you know, they identify some sort of a gene or a function, they figure out what the target is. We talked about that, all the different techniques. And of course you do a lot of validation. Now you get more precise and saying, okay, is this really the target? What other things can I do to verify that? And then, and then we'll talk about these other two steps, lead discovery and optimization. Um, and then of course you go into studies, the clinical studies. Clear? All right, I'm just gonna keep going if you guys are selling. Right. Um, and uh, screening is how they actually do this, right? So th originally, this was one of the biggest problems. You know, you speak to anyone in the industry and they tell you, oh, a lot of time I spend just like in the lab, just trying different assays and like 
pipetting and like doing things. And so there's been a lot of advancement in this area. High throughput screening has been around for a while, but it allows you to sort of automate all those things and then try um, try a whole bunch of compounds in you know sort of a lot batch mode with automation. Um, it's great because it, it you know it sort of like avoids the whole drudgery of having to do this manually, but of course, it's still a very, it's, it's still a mechanical process. You still have to do it, have the machine actually go and like do it and like see, wait for the results, and that takes time. And this is why, obviously, we want to do this. More stuff in the computer is better, right? So, um, cool. So this slide I like because um, this starts to get to the point of like, okay, so there's this, there's your, Let's say you go through the screening process, like you, you figured out, okay, let's, you figured out like what drug targets to go after. So I know, okay, so this is my disease. I, I figure out what, what are the targets that I can actually potentially go after. And then I figure out a way to screen a whole bunch of compounds and I've actually found some hits. Like there's like, like a thousand of them actually got, you know, got hits. Now that's great, but that's, you're not done. You have to now figure out out of those thousand hits, which ones are actually things that, um, you know, are, are like leads? Which, which, which means it has to now, you know, you know, there has to be like more requirements that it has to meet now. Which, which are these things? So if you think about the whole space, and, and we'll get into this concept of a chemical space, which is let's say, of all, of all the chemicals, small molecules for now, that potentially could exist in the universe, right? Um, not all of them are active. Um, components or chemicals. Um, so, e and so how big is this space? So there are various studies that have tried to estimate the space, which in itself is a hard problem. But right now, they say it's around like 10 to the power of 60 molecules. That's the overall, at least the, the guesstimate of that, is the overall like, it's, you know, uh, size of that chemical space. And that's a pretty big space. So out of that space, which is where if you see this whole thing is the one big chemical space, and out of that, there's only a sm much smaller space where, where these, you know, these solution spaces all intersect, which is one, it has to actually be like, you can actually make a drug out of it. Like this is the drug likeness, we'll talk about this later. So it's not enough we find a chemical that's like, oh, this is a hit. Can we make a drug out of it that people can actually ingest? And then it has to like be absorbed in the system and, and there's a whole bunch of other things that need to happen. Um, and then uh, is it stable enough that you can actually make it? Or is this gonna just like, disintegrate as soon as you make it and then you can't ship it? Like, so all those kinds of like, actual practical things that need to happen. And of course it's safe enough, you know, and, and all these other things. So if these spaces have to intersect, and this is where this, this diagram is so, so great where it talks about my, my hit could be in somewhere over there where I figured out its, it's, its efficacy, but then does it actually meet all these other, intersect with all these other spaces? and I kind of find something that, that can be a, you know, an actual true lead. And that's the whole process of hit lead optimization. And, and, and you know, we'll, we'll talk more about how people do that, but any questions on this? I think it's an important slide, but um, cool. All right, great. So, so anyway, so this is the cycle, right? So this is the problem. So it's like, okay, find the, find the log, find hits, figure out a way to like come up with a lot of hits, and then narrow down to actual leads where um, now, you can say, okay, these are like good candidates for me to actually go pursue more, right? And, and that's the process that this diagram talks about. It's like, hey, you have a bunch of compounds, you have assays that you run, you find hits, you know, you look for leads, and then you optimize your leads, and then you start your design process, and you synthesize your drug and whatnot. And, um, and this concept of drug likeness will come, a drug like substance is like, you know, one has to be available, has to be, you know, has to meet all these, has to be water soluble, because that's how, you know, it, it will get distributed in our body, but then it also be fat soluble because it has to enter the cell membrane. Anyways, there's a whole bunch of other things that, you know, it, it needs to meet, and the molecular weight has to be less than this, and we'll talk about a few more rules where it has to meet before, before it can actually be turned into a drug, right? So, um, how many of you have seen this slide? This, Maybe the people who's like, there you go, okay. A few people, so this is, this is, uh, there was a study done, I think it was six years ago or something, and um, it talks about um, the reducing, uh, the declining efficiency of R&D in pharmaceutical industry. So, so how many of you heard of Moore's Law? There you go, lots of you go. 
So this, they even have a term for this. It's called uh, Irum's law, which is the opposite of Moore's law. You know, more, put more the opposite. And so the, the, the pharmaceutical R&D industry is actually going the opposite direction, which is it's taking longer and more expensive to get drugs to market. And that's what this whole, whole study talks about. And, and it, you know, just, it basically takes the last you know, 60 years of R&D in the pharma industry. And this graph, as you can see, is going the opposite direction, which is actually it's the number of drugs um, yeah, per billion dollars spent in R&D is actually going down. And there's a clear trend. Right? So, so this is a big problem in the industry. And so of course, um, there was a lot of impetus to try to fix this, um, this trend. And uh, of course, AI is, is, is and you know, data-driven techniques have been, have been proposed as like the solution to some of that. And we'll see you know, how it can actually help. Um, yes. Yeah, so the, the paper talks about it. There's a few factors they do identify, FDA regulations being one of them. And also, they talk about that, you know, that this sort of the low-hanging fruit. And this goes back to the drug targeting, and then the, the number of targets available is not so many, and people are going to the same targets. And so we've sort of exhausted those things, and, we need, and, then, and then, of course, the, the whole timeline it takes for us to, you know, for, some, for the pharma industry to go from, hey, target identified, you know, identify hits, identify leads, even the R&D phase, and this is where I think the next slide, you know, we talk about where does this time actually go? And, and so the R&D phase of it is like one third, but yes, the clinical testing side is the majority of it. Like two thirds of the time is spent in sort of like human testing and like, and the FDA rules definitely didn't help with this. Um, but of course, you know, the, the, the reason why FDA has these rules in the first place is because of safety. Right? So we don't want drugs out there, and by the way, um, there's been studies, I'll talk about this, there's another study that was a more recent study that talks about um, the, the failure rates in these various phases and the causes for those. But, but those, those, those um, uh, the regulations are there for, for a reason, right? And so, because it's, it's to ensure that the drugs are first safe, that first they're efficient, and they actually do what they claim to do, which is they solve the thing that, they're, that, that the pharma companies say they will. And then they do it safely, and then they do it, you know, safely under certain conditions, under stress, under like where, like we're taking other medications, right? So what is the interactions with these medications that people might be taking, and so on? So there's, that's why you have all these various phases, and then we'll we can actually go through them, but, um, and that's you know that's the breakdown of, of uh, the timeline. But is that answer your question, Andrew? Uh, great. Um, so. And computers have been used in this domain for a while now. Like I think computer-aided drug, drug design has been around for a while. What is, what is new, obviously, is the machine learning techniques and the deep learning-based techniques that are being used more. So if you think about you know, computer drug design, there's sort of two camps, or like two broad uh, divisions. One, which is the structure-based, and then there's the ligand-based, which is, it's once again, the lock and key. You know, either it's, you know, you go after the lock, you figure out the, you understand the structure of the lock, and then you try to design a key. Or you say, hey, I know this key actually works with this other lock. So I'm just gonna look for similar keys, and then just like hope I can find like other keys. So that's sort of like the broad, two, like the way, really, you know, broad way. I'm just, you know, hand waving, but that's sort of like the big differentiations between these two kind of techniques. Um, of course, there's, there's multiple sub techniques. We're doing a lot of different things, but, uh, but let's let's not go over them right now. The other big thing, you know, when you talk about data data driven techniques, driver machine learning, deep learning, it's always going to be okay. How do I represent my data? You know, how can I take this complex structure like this, and how can I turn it into something that I can feed it into a machine learning model, right? Um, and so uh, there are a few techniques, and people are coming up with new ways, but. Um, the main ones, there's dimensional, like, you know, you can have like single dimensional descriptors, um, which are just KLR values, like, hey, uh, what is the property of this molecule? What is the water solubility? What is the weight? What's the charge? The number of, number of bonds? You know, you can come up with a whole bunch of like, you know, single valued uh, descriptors. Um, and and they're great. I mean, they, they actually can be useful, like, to actually feed into a, you know, if you, if you take all of them together, then you can actually come up with a lot of single value features for your model and then feed them in and they're really useful, right? And so log P 
Hershey of solubilities. And then there's like rules which can also tell you. Lipinski's rule of phi is like wide, you know, well-known rule, which is like, hey, there's five things if um, to sort of figure out if your candidate, uh, your hit is actually drug-like or not. And things like the number of uh, hydrogen bond donors and what is the lock P value, what is the you know, molecular weight is a big thing. Most drugs that actually reach the market, like I want to say 90% of the drugs that actually get to market are all small, but what's called a small molecule drugs, which means they follow this rule number two, which is they're less than 500. I don't know what the DA stands for now. Does anyone know? Dalton's, thank you, yes. Um, yeah, the molecular weight. Um, so, so that's sort of like single dimension is really useful. It's still in use, uh, you know, people do use it, like even now. We'll talk about like the Tox21 challenge and what they ended up using too, but. And, but this is, the other thing that's widely used is really the 2D descriptors, which is really just a fingerprinting technique. The, the problem with, as you saw, like taking a complex molecular structure and then coming up with sort of a way to fingerprint it, right? And so uh, the, there have been some widely used techniques, um, specifically the circular fingerprinting one, um, and what it does, it takes any compound like that and sort of like tries to, you know, go one atom at a time and literally like says like, hey, what are my, within a given amount of distance from that, you know, um, atom, what are the other atoms around me, what are the number of bonds, and then, you know, tries to calculate sort of a hash of that and then, you know, mark a bit if that's, you know, true or not. And so this does it around for every atom, and then you have a bit vector at the end, and then yes, there's collisions that could happen, but, but you know, and then the similarity is that once you have the bit vector, then you actually try to do similarity searches using, you know, techniques like, um, it's sort of like a Jacquard-like technique, if you will, and says like, hey, how similar is these two chemicals using the bit vector that I just calculated? And the, the popular one is this, um, the extended circular, they call it the CFP. And then the X basically denotes how many, how many, what is the radius that you're actually drawing your circle around. So you pick an atom, and what is the radius that you're looking around? And so you can actually figure out which bits and the mark and based, based on the radius. So it's, this is sort of the workhorse, if you will, for any kind of machine learning technique. This is what most people do, um, is use these sort of ECFE sort of fingerprinting. And there's like libraries that allow you to do this. We'll talk more about the libraries and frameworks later on. But, um, Questions? No. All right, I'm gonna keep going. Sorry, was there a hand? Okay. And this other thing, QSAR, you'll heard this too a lot, of, um, stands for quantitative structure activity relationships. Um, basically, it's a way to sort of predict the activity of a chemical compound based on its structure. And so this was a technique that was popular and like, it's still used. Um, where they would say, okay, so if I modify the structure this way, what is it going to do to, to you know, the activity of the chemical compound itself? And, um, and, and this has been around for many years. Um, and machine learning also, you know, there's machine learning techniques that actually, you know, they try to train a model, a regression model or whatever, to try to actually predict what that uh, activity could be. And, and uh, it's also heavily used. Um, and of course, then, then we get into small strings. So the, the, speaking of representation, this is like probably one of the most widely used, probably, uh, you know, I wanna say this is at least, it, you know, representation formats um, for chemical compounds. The beauty of it is it's mostly ASCII strings, so you can actually, it's sort of human readable. So you can turn any sort of like complex, you know, chemical compound like that into a series of ASCII strings, um, as you can see like at the bottom. So you start there, you know, or A, B, and C, and, like, and then so you figure out, you know. The, the trick is um, where do you start and then how do you actually figure out, like because there's for the same chemical compound you could have like different strings, but you know, there's a canonical way of doing it. So if you, if you, you know, if you do it the canonical way, then it should be the same string for the same compound. But, and so, but this is most the widely used way to represent any chemical compound. So if you're dealing with chemical data sets, most of them will have small strings which is just like ASCII strings, which look like that. So, um, and then you can take this and basically just do the fingerprinting thing we talked about and then turn it into a bit vector, right? So we're getting close. 
of course, there's new ways to also do fingerprinting. There's neural fingerprinting. Um, people, this is whole graph convolution network that people are using to actually, you know, compute a different kind of embedding for the chemical compound itself. There's autoencoders being used to to represent the latent, you know, thing. So, are we familiar with autoencoders, right? Or, oh. All right. Um, so, getting back to the drug safety assessment. Okay, so that was sort of like my recap of like, you know, seven seasons of uh, Game of Thrones. So now we'll actually get to, okay, how is AI um, actually getting used here and what are some of the techniques? Um, so drug safety assessment, um, according to a study by uh, Tuft Center, the, the top reasons, three main causes, as they say, was uh, the efficacy was like rather lack thereof. Uh, why does the FDA actually reject drugs? Most of the time, so this is the biggest, biggest problem, right? So this, you saw the funnel a few slides ago where like the thousands of compounds at the top of the funnel, and then by the time it actually gets the approval, there's like one compound, compound left. And, mo and the top three reasons, according to the study, was the efficacy was like the top reason where it actually didn't do what, what the pharma company claimed it would. And then uh, safety was the number two, right? So it's like either it was like unexpected adverse effects um, or serious risks to life, right, or some other cause where they had to like abandon the study and like literally, you know, reject the drug. Um, and then of course the other one, which is like, it does what it does, but doesn't do it enough, and there's commercial reasons, so the, so the pharma company would actually say, okay, we're not gonna actually put this drug out because it's just not worth it at this point, and not enough of a lift, right? Um, yeah, and there's more numbers around like, hey, 71 of the 200 ton were like, um, were withdrawn, and, and this is the post approval. So, so first of all, it, it, it's so hard to get the drug into the market because, it, you know, because of all these failure reasons. And, but even if you manage, somehow manage to get it out of the market, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of other things that can go wrong once the thing is actually out in the market. And there's another study that talks about like one third, <laughs> almost one third of all the drugs that get into market actually were recalled for some safety reason or the other. Um, so, and, and you know, it was like, take, takes many years, by the way, so where the drugs was approved, but then the safety concern, they had to like recall or whatever, for four years. And, and the accelerated approval process, once again, this goes back to, well, is it just regulation? So, you know, that's why the FDA put in this new thing called, hey, we're gonna just get drugs to market faster if that's the only thing that's blocking us, and we'll have accelerated approval processes. But those had a higher rate of safety recalls <laughs> compared to like the regular process. And so, so, so there's a problem here. Like, there's a problem is not the FDA. <laughs> the problem is not because we have rules. We cannot figure out, like, how to actually create drugs, uh, you know, and assess the safety of these drugs, right? And the techniques that we have right now are not good enough. And so, it's that's what's holding us back, right? That's what's holding us back is we can't like efficiently determine, like, starting with the drug discovery cycle. You saw these like 10-year cycle where like R&D phase and you're finding drug, you know, the targets and leads and optimizing all these things. If we could actually figure out if this, this compound that we just had a hit on is safe enough or not, um, then it would save us all of this time and money we have to spend before we realize. It's almost like the, you know, you find a bug earlier in the you know, project requirements phase and it's you know, gonna cost you less. You've seen this graph where you find it later on, it's just more and more expensive. It's the same idea, <laughs> right? Um, so, so that's where this challenge, and like there's a lot of activity going on. And like specifically, I want to talk about the Tox 21 challenge. This was, I mean, it's, it's actually, I think, almost five years now since this challenge is out. It was put out by the National Institute of Health. They wanted to figure out um, how can we sort of improve this thing? How can we improve the state of the affairs? It's, it's taking us so long, it's so expensive. We don't even find these things until four years after the drug goes to market. One third of drugs are like not safe. So they, they want to crowdsource this problem um, by independent researchers. How can we predict the compounds like, um, and using the chemical structure data alone, how can we predict to see if like they're, you know, what, what is the toxicity and like, you know, the safety and whatnot. And so this, um, there was like 10,000 compounds data set that they put out. Um, there was like, it's kind of like a, you know, Kaggle-like, you know, competition. They had a training set, they had a test set, and they had a leaderboard set, and then like there was also um, multiple labels that you had to sort of um, um, predict. And, and we'll talk more about that. But so we'll cut to the chase. So the winner was this was this uh, group from um, university in um, Austria. 
Bioinformatics University. Um, they, you know, they came up with solutions, deep learning based, it was called Deep Talks. Um, they won the grand challenge, they had multiple challenges. It was the grand challenge, it was like whoever does the best accuracy overall, and they, and they measured the metrics, it was an area of cur area under curve. Um, and then, um, so they came up, their solution won the grand challenge, it also won, there was two sets of um, things you had to predict. One was structure based, and then I think stress based, and then the other one was like nuclear reactor based, but they were all like toxicity related, like, um, labels they were trying to predict. And deep tox was, um, as you would imagine, I mean, the pipeline looks very similar to any machine learning pipeline. The only difference is, of course, they use deep learning techniques. We'll get into some of those things. But basically what they did was normalize the chemical representations, you know, compute large number of descriptors, feed it to a you know, machine learning model, train the model. They, you know, they, they train multiple models. We'll talk about deep learning being the, you know, uh, and then also they trained uh, SVMs, they trained random forests, and they, they did some ensembling and uh, predicted the toxicity. So what was really cool, the other thing to me was this concept of multitask learning. How many of you have heard of multitask learning? All right, great, a few people. So um, this data set, because it had multiple like sort of uh, classes it was trying to predict, um, and these sort of classes, um, so first of all, multitask learning is where you can actually, you're trying to predict multiple classes of things, like from one data set, right? So it's, and, 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 and not just one single target variable, you have multiple variables you're trying to predict, right? And so, and, and the idea is that while trying to predict these multiple labels or, or variables, you can actually infer some commonalities, and there's actually a correlation, there's some sort of a correlation between these sort of multiple variable, target variables. And, and, and you can use this in order to do better than you would do if you just were trying to predict one target very well. Does that make sense? Right. And so this, this is what this, like, this is straight from the paper. They, when they did this, because they were able to prove that the target variables, the multiple target variables were actually correlated, they had a big enough data set um, that their numbers, like if you see the, the AAC for the, the multitask version is actually better, in most cases, <laughs> than the single task version. And then they have a baseline with the SVM baseline and compare that. And so those are the tasks that they were trying to actually predict, right? Um, and so this, this was really cool because then the bigger problem, like one of the things at least we're struggling with is like in a single task problem, like you have this imbalance problem um, where you're trying to predict one thing, there's not enough signal for that one single task. And this sort of gets over that. So even if you have a data set which is highly imbalanced and you don't have a lot of signal, and by having this sort of multitask approach, you can sort of take multiple weeks, weak learners and sort of like try to, try to make a stronger one. So almost like you know, ensembling, but really not. Anyway, so this, this was a huge, I think it gave them some you know, comparative lift to just doing single task. In some cases, it was like almost more than 10 percentage points. Um, um, so yeah, so this, this I want to just call this out. The other thing that was really interesting in this paper was um, this, this concept of like toxic force, which is, let's say it's just a bunch of rules. Like if you're, if you're doing toxicity studies, like there are certain rules, once again, like Lipinski's, but they're just can think of them as different rules where you can say, hey, if my chemical has these kinds of structural you know, things, then it's probably toxic. <laughs> probably not a good thing. So there's like a whole bunch of these rules, and then you can actually go to the chemical and just sort of like, you know, compute these rules and compute these, you know, sort of features. Um, and then use them as inputs. Now, what they saw was the, once they used them as inputs, they saw that the, the, the neural network was actually sort of also learning these um, and, and, and actually you know, firing based on the level it was. And so this, this is sort of similar to like the typical neural network diagram you see where like you feed an image and it starts to detect sort of like these edges and then it starts to detect like, you know, like, like a facial recognition net neural network where like it starts to detect like parts of the face and then like, Feature, you know, and then the actual phases and so on. So that way, it's it's actually detecting and learning higher, you know, hierarchical features on its own. And th what they found was, and this makes sense if you think about it retroactively, which is the number of such toxic for features that it was like, you know, detecting was going down as the hidden layers in the network um, was actually going up. So this is the first graph here, A, that it talks about like, hey, if my layer is one, there's actually more. The, the percentage of neurons that actually find tox, you know, uh, is actually higher, and then it keeps going down as the layers go, go down, right? As it gets, 
you know, and, and, and then, but, but the other chart talks about where the precision, like the, the actual correlation of these to real toxic pore is actually going up. So what, what does this mean? Like, how do you interpret this? It means that, that the earlier layers are, are picking up more things, but they're not necessarily significant things. They're just, in this, think about the, once again, the facial recognition neural network. It's just, you know, you can think, hey, it's picking up edges, it pick, it's pick, picks up other smaller level features, lower level features, and then as you go down the depth, you, it picks up higher and higher level features. But there's less of them, right? But, but it's picking up more important features. So, which is really cool, right? So it's, it's th and this is sort of the power of deep learning, right? It's, if you think about like going back to the miracle drug of penicillin, <laughs> where you had one drug which was, you know, which could cure like all kind of bacteria, uh, you know, for us obviously deep learning is like the equivalent of that in, um, you know, in, in, in machine learning, right? Because it's this one technique that can actually learn, and think about a domain like heavy, you know, like domain knowledge heavy like area where like drug discovery where there's so much things that you have to learn even to understand what we're talking about. But then you train this thing that has no concept of like any of these things and it just starts picking up these kinds of things, which is, which is amazing, right? So, um, and so this will be making more clear what I'm talking about, which is the feature construction, right? So this is also, this image is from their paper, but they, the neurons have, so if you, if you look at the top level and you go down, it's going down layers. So the first, the, the topmost row, it picks up uh, these sort of like toxicophores, which are smaller and they're not as complex. And then as it goes down, you start to see the complexity of the, the structure that it's recognizing uh, gets, you know, higher. And so this, this, is the, this, is the, this is what the previous graph was actually trying to say, which is, hey, yes, it, it might pick up more things, but there's gonna be simpler, but then as it goes down, is actually picking up you know, higher and higher levels of complexity and, you know, and features. Um, this is pretty cool. Um, yeah, I got two minutes. Let me see if I can show, like, I'm just gonna show, you know, this quick demo, but hold on just a sec, really. We just took the, the, uh, their notebook and turned it into a workflow. Let's see if I can just show this to you guys. Okay, sorry, I'm not showing a notebook, but <laughs> anyway, so this is just a workflow platform that you know, we're working on, but so essentially, uh, it takes the talk, so anyone, uh, I don't know, Ron, let me see, I can just run this. It takes a while to run. I'm not gonna actually wait here for it to actually train the model. By the way, training this model doesn't take a long time, it's like a few minutes. The bigger time in the paper they talk about is like coming up with all the hyperparameter search. They had to figure out the architecture of the deep learning and they did thousands of variations. They used a GPU, I think it was Tesla K40 something. Um, and, and they finally figured out what was the right uh, architecture for the deep network itself. But and this, this basic workflow basically just, yeah, does a train and test split, uh, transforms, smiles to features. We talked about smiles, we talked about like the fingerprinting features, and they actually added a lot more features than just the fingerprinting ones. They added a whole bunch of other one-dimensional features. They added like, um, um, yeah, they did a whole a bunch of other things. Um, they also clustered um, similar compounds. They did fragmentation where they would actually look for fragments of compounds because, and, you know, because if, if, if two chemicals had very similar structures, you know, you sort of break them into fragments and then sort of combine them and then treat them as one. Um, and so they did all kinds of techniques like that. Um, um, and they defined the models and then trained and so on. Um, and then, uh, yeah. And then finally, yeah, you get the ROC curve, which looks, looks like that. Um, okay. I want to just let it run, but see if I can go back. Forty seconds. Okay. Quick uh, thing: there's lots of tools and databases out there. RDKit is probably the most well-known framework. If you guys are wanting to do any kind of work in there, you got to look up RDKit. It has like lots of built-in libraries to the fingerprinting thing we talked about. Um, it's a great library. DeepChem is the one that you want to have if you're wanting to do deep learning-based things, right? So DeepChem builds on RDKit. You know, it's built by this group from Stanford. Vijay Pandey, you know, his whole group. Um, they actually have a book called, called Now Deep Learning for Life Sciences. It's a great book, go check it out. 
Campbell is like publicly available databases uh, with a bunch of chemical compounds and all the kinds of properties that are pre-computed. PDBind is another great database, but it's about like the protein ligand, you know, and how well they fit and all that. And then click to drug org is like a whole bunch of tools, open source, all kinds of tools that it lists. Some of the resources I have, um, these slides will be up there so you guys can go read this. Um, summary, you know, all the stuff we talked about, drug safety is like, you know, pretty important if we have to get this right. And I think AI techniques are definitely making an impact. And I will open it up for questions, 30 seconds to go. If you have any questions, uh, please come to the mic. Are there certain areas where you've seen more promise from AI and drug discovery? Like certain classes of drugs or certain classes of diseases? I'm sorry, yeah. So I think the question was, uh, yeah, there are more, some areas which are more, seem more promising than others. I, I think so, I think, if you think about drug discovery, yeah, I mean, safety obviously is one area. And then I also see another area where we're actually working where they're, so this is whole this chemical space problem, which is there's so many possible chemicals. Where do we actually the search? It's always kind of a search problem, right? Like it's like, hey, I got this big big space. How do I narrow down things so that I can actually find things that are going to be relevant? That's a whole area too where I think AI can help uh, if we can actually figure out tools and ways to actually narrow down based on what they're looking for. Like if I know my target is this, how can I narrow down the space to actually come up with potential candidates that will then meet all these criteria that I want, drug likeness, safety, and all of these other things. And of course, there's, there's people working just on safety and like, about, you know, assessment alone. And of course, there's also areas where a lot of, there's over 100 startups, by the way, in this area, <laughs> I should have mentioned, that are trying to solve various problems in the space. Most of them are focused on coming up with, the, with novel sort of drug candidates and how do you automate that process, most of them. Um, using sort of GANs and things like that. They're saying, hey, we can just tell you, like, you know, come up with new ideas for drugs that will have all these things baked in and then we're just gonna, you know, you, you don't have to go through this process and then fail. So that's where the, the activity is mostly around. But I think there's also lots of other areas um, that, that are still like, being explored. So, yeah, great question. Yeah. That's it, all right, thanks guys, that was my time, thank you.